Tonight, the MIT Committee on Campus Race Relations welcomes you to the first event of a very special series that we're calling Race 2000. This series of events is intended to be both a retrospective about the racial situation in America and a clarion call for the future. Although the dawn of a new century is an arbitrary marking point, we are opting to use this opportunity to consider the ways that race, gender, class, and other, re other related issues were addressed and are currently being addressed as we approach that date. We have entitled the, the event tonight as an evening of conversation because we wanted to create an event that is simple in format yet provocative, profound, inspirational in concept. Conversation. That word is often used in a casual manner and it is rarely used to describe events of great intellectual import. In academia, we have become accustomed to attending debates, colloquia, seminars, lectures, summits, conferences, and symposia. Yet in my opinion, none of these terms describe that most, most basic form of human interaction, communication, the way that the term conversation does. Tonight, we intend to explore questions that are of profound concern to us all by conversing across lines that are seldom traversed in our modern fragmented society. Race is the primary concern of the Committee on Campus Race Relations. However, we realize that it is not possible to comprehensively explore issues of race without also considering gender issues, class issues, sexuality issues, and the entire range of economic and political considerations that influence, the, that influence and affect the qualities of our lives. This event and the other events that will be presented in this series in the, in the coming months is an attempt to create a program that takes into account these complexities. When I first began to tell people about this event, the most frequent question I've been a I was asked is how did we come up with the idea to place Noam Chomsky and Kathleen Cleaver on the same program? People were quick to point out their differences. He is a white male intellectual. She is a black female activist, they said. What could they possibly have in common, I was asked. My answer then and now is that I was thinking about their similarities when we structured the program. They're both educators, both social and political activists, both intellectuals, and they have both dedicated their lives to exploring and implementing ways to bring about positive change both nationally and globally. The program this evening is designed to challenge the traditional limiting and in some instances restricting ways that we have, that we have uh, been divided into, uh, that we've been divided and kept isolated from one another. If we can even be partially successful in finding our common ground and deepening our awareness and commitment to struggling for understanding and change, we will have accomplished our purpose tonight. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce our two guests. Professor Noam Chomsky is a graduate of Harvard University. He has been on the faculty of MIT in the Department of Modern Languages and Linguistics since 1955. He currently holds the position of institute professor. He's received numerous awards, holds several honorary degrees, and belongs to a number of professional and learned societies. Professor Chomsky has written and lectured widely on linguistics, philosophy, intellectual history, contemporary issues, international affairs, and U.S. foreign policy. While it is not possible to recount the extensive list of his published works in this introduction, it is possible for me to state my opinion that Professor Chomsky's works represent in both breadth and depth one of the most remarkable explorations of issues central to any agenda for positive social change in our history. Professor Kathleen Cleaver is currently visiting professor at Benjamin N. Cordozo School of Law. She is a graduate of Yale College and Yale Law School, uh, who, who completed these uh, two degrees in the 1980s. Professor Cleaver's original college education was interrupted in the mid-1960s when she left school to join the Civil Rights Movement. She initially worked full-time in the New York office of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, later moved to Atlanta to continue working with SNCC, and eventually married Eldridge Cleaver and became Communications Secretary of the Black Panther Party. She spent several years in exile in Algiers, Algeria, Algiers, Algiers, Algeria, with her family, all the while continuing to speak on and write on behalf of the black liberation struggle. She returned to the U.S. and completed her education. After law school, she was a member of a law firm, served as a clerk in a U.S. Court of Appeals office, taught at Emory University from 1992 to 1994, and was awarded a Bunting Fellowship in 1995. In addition to, teaching, to, to her teaching duties, she is currently working on her memoir, which she's entitled, Memories of Love and War.
Now, after just a little bit about the format, after we complete the first part of the program, which will consist of questions and conversation, there will be time for members of the audience to pose questions from the floor. Yeah, where are my questions? Okay, there we are. All right. Okay, so here's the first question. You have both led intriguing lives as radical activist intellectuals. Tell us when you got started on this path. Was there a special incident that provoked your involvement or something in your family background that promoted, that prompted your activism? I gotta remember farther back, so I'll go first. <laughs> uh, well, I was a child of the Depression, uh, came from, uh, Good part of my family was, uh, it was an immigrant family, first generation immigrant, uh, uh, like other immigrant ethnic communities, very bound to the ethnic group, uh, Jewish in this case. Uh, my immediate family, a lot of them were, uh, working, most of them in fact, were working class people that meant mostly unemployed, uh, wide range of, uh, it was a very lively period, uh, uh, and uh, it was the, uh, very intellectually alive, a lot of activism, and you know, I sort of grew up in, in the middle of it. Uh, I don't know what to point to, I mean, I have early childhood memories of uh, people coming to the door hungry, trying to sell rags of uh, uh, traveling on streetcars with my mother and passing by uh, strikes, textile strikes, where women were outside being beaten up by police. We have a very violent labor history in the United States and uh, unusual, in fact, unique in the industrial world. <clears throat> and uh, till the late 30s, workers were still getting murdered by private and uh, uh, government security forces. Uh, and, uh, meanwhile, fascism was extending over Europe. It was very frightening. <clears throat> I could see it as a child. We were the, we happened to be the only Jewish family in a very anti-Semitic neighborhood, and the immediate certain surroundings were scary. You know, especially with those black clouds in the background. Uh, there just was not ever much of a question. By the time I was 11 or 12, I was hanging around uh, anarchist bookstores in New York and you know, talking to guys who had escaped from Spain during the, you know, after the fascists took over. And, and so it continued. <laughs> <laughs> when did I get started? Uh, my parents were activists, radicals, before I was born. My father was working on the uh, something called the Texas white primary, and it was a Democratic primary. The South was uh, all Democrat back then, and there were activists, both black and white, in East Texas trying to put an end to the all white primary. Uh, my mother was um, active in school desegregation in Virginia at the time when uh, blacks could go to black elementary school, black <laughs> high school and black colleges, but if you wanted to go past, if you wanted to go to graduate school, there was no place in Virginia. So one of her friends was a plaintiff in a lawsuit against the state of Virginia to allow blacks to attend the University of Virginia so they could go to graduate school. And this United, the state of Virginia settled it. And instead of allowing any black um, person to attend the University of Virginia, what they said is that they would pay their tuition to go to any college, any graduate school in the United States that would take them. So my mother took advantage of this and went to study, or she was a mathematician, she went to study at the University of Michigan, which was a much better deal, actually, <laughs> than the uh, <laughs> University of Virginia. And my parents met there, so she had been an activist, he was an activist, he would come up from Texas and work on his PhD in rural social development, rural sociology, something that was called community development, but that at that time, at that era, very few people knew about it. So I was born into this family, but I was also born uh, around the time that the McCarthy era was becoming very intense. And so even though my parents were active and most of their friends were activists, I, they never talked about it. I never heard about these things. I read about them much, much later. Uh, what I begin to remember is being a, a young child in Tuskegee Institute in Alabama in the 1940s and 50s, 
where uh, I lived, uh, Tuskegee Institute, was 45 miles away from Montgomery. And it was a place where people who started the Montgomery bus boycott in the 1950s civil rights work would come and have meetings, and they'd plan to do things. And there were boycotts. And I remember going on boycotts. And I remember uh, hearing about voter registration campaigns and lawsuits. I think a million versus Lightfoot is the suit about the gerrymander of Tuskegee. So the world in which I came conscious was uh, an activist world challenging segregation. And then when I was nine years old, my father stopped teaching at Tuskegee Institute. He went to uh, work in a program that at that time was called Technical Cooperation Mission, later came to be called Agency for International Development. But he went to India in the 1950s at a time when the United States government was beginning to try in third world countries, in non-white areas, in non-European areas, to persuade the government not to be friendly with communists. And one of the ways they decided to persuade the government of India, which was very independent and had just gotten out of a colonial relationship with a European power, with Britain, was to persuade them that the United States was not like their former colonial power. And how did they do this? They found black technicians to send to <laughs> India to work in villages. My father was one. He took me. And I just looked and saw a beautiful, uh, impressive world in which the entire government and the entire country was run by people of color. And they seemed to be doing quite a good job. And so <laughs> it was no it, it never occurred to me that there was any validity or any sense or any reason for whites to run everybody's lives. So I immediately became totally uh, un uh, uh, incompatible, uh, improperly socialized to grow up in Alabama. I mean, I'm, where, I, <laughs> where I'm living, you know, the black people run the country, the minister and the president and the prime minister. But in Alabama, where my friends are growing up, their parents, who may have graduate degrees, who have skin color, they can't even vote. They can't vote. They can't do anything. So immediately I know this is wrong. Now the incident that kind of triggered my involvement was later. I was a high school student in 1962, I believe, 62, 63. And I saw on the pages of the newspaper outside of Philadelphia in the high school that I was attending. I was a, at a boarding school. My parents were living in Africa. I was there. There was one black professor, uh, one black student from the town, two black boarders, and a Japanese student and an African. The rest of the people were white, everybody. So I'm in this world that's very white. It was the first time in my life I'd lived in Africa and Asia and Macon County, and you don't see too many white people in any of those places. <laughs> um, and these girls were in the back of a paddy wagon, and they were smiling, and they were singing. And the story was about the Albany, Georgia, protest against the denial of the right to vote. And the high school students who were getting arrested because they were protesting, and they would go to jail, and they would sing. And what was so intriguing was that they were smiling. And I, I said, well, they look so happy. And a young woman put a sign outside the, the dining hall and said, we should fast in sympathy with the students from Albany who are fasting in jail. And I went on in the dining hall, didn't think about it. And the next day, I came in, and there was another sign up that said, Fasting is stupid. We shouldn't do that. We should find something more cooperative to do to solve this problem. And I became infuriated. Who is this student? They, of course, they're all white because every, and I know it wasn't one of the black students who put this note up. So who is this white boy who's so protected, who has a superior attitude that he can tell young black women in Georgia who are risking their lives to change the system what they should do? So I just became infuriated decided I was going to find out everything about that struggle. I went to Philadelphia. I talked to activists who trained people to go down to Albany. I wrote everything down. I came back in a fury, wrote out a two-page speech, and asked if I could speak at the assembly. Our school had an assembly every, uh, every Tuesday and Thursday. And I asked the art teacher, who was my friend. She said, oh, sure. She didn't ask me what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> she said, sure, Kathleen, you can speak at the assembly. And I got up and I read this speech and told them what this movement was about and what these students were doing and why they were doing it and why Martin Luther King was right and why nonviolence was a good thing and why they should support them. And literally, I had no idea that this would upset people. I, 
It's a Quaker school. I thought they were for nonviolent protest. <laughs> uh, that's the um, event that sort of got me going. And then in the same town, Tuskegee, where I was from, one of my classmates, young man I grew up with, when I was a college student here in New York, was murdered, shot in the back by a gas station attendant. It, my friend's name was Sammy Young. He was a student, he was a SNCC worker, he was an activist, and he was murdered after receiving lots and lots and lots of death threats, but he was murdered in an argument with a white gas station attendant over which bathroom he was gonna use. The one that used to be identified for white men or the one that used to be identified for colored males because the signs had been taken down. He was shot in the back and left at the Grace, Greyhound bus station across the street. And that, that incident was very personal, very painful. And I'd say six months later, I was no longer a college student. I was a civil rights worker. I was a full-time civil rights worker and gradually just became very more and more and more revolutionary as the resistance against our efforts to change the society increased. Okay. Or a short answer. <laughs> no, it's, it's a good answer. <laughs> what has allowed you both to maintain your momentum for so many years? And I should, you know, all of us know that many people our age have, have fallen by the wayside. The politics change, you get older, you're thinking about all kinds of things, but both of you have continued on in doing the work that you do. What, what, what makes that possible? <laughs> I'd like to know the reason. <laughs> the real reason, the secret, the reason no one will tell you is that it's joyful to struggle. You always feel, at least I feel, happiest when I know I'm doing something that can in some way break through and break down the kind of barriers that restrict people's ability to be creative, to be whole, to be healthy, and it makes me happy. Now, it makes a lot of other people feel different things, and sometimes I've wondered, I mean, as I walk into situations where people are trying to kill me or walk into situations where it looks like, oh, this, this might be it, uh, I don't really feel joy then, but... Um, <laughs> I will say that joining the, I talked to my father into letting me join the civil rights movement with this argument. I said, you're sending me to college. You're paying, now you can tell how long ago this was, you're paying $800 a semester. <laughs> I'm not getting a good education. Give me the money, let me join the movement and I'll really get an education. And he said, okay, I'll do it for one year. And I took the money and I went to the civil rights movement because the movement was so collapsed it had not enough, didn't have money to pay people's salaries. So I lived on like $100 a month. At the end of the year, he told me, your year is up, you have to go back to college. That was our deal. And I said, but I'm in the middle of a revolution. I can't go back to school. And he said, well, I can't send you any more money. So I stayed in the revolution and I didn't ever have a lot of money, but I learned more than I'd ever learned in my life. I became an entirely different kind of very uh, competent person with all the kinds of skills that I could potentially have developed. Each one was developed because I was forced to do things. And I enjoy learning and I enjoy interacting with people and I enjoy the exhilaration of feeling somehow or other we can change this culture and make a difference. That's what keeps me going. <laughs> well, I guess uh, we really are at opposite poles in a lot of respects. Uh, I feel the same way you do with regard to the last sentence. I think there are things we can do. But to tell you the honest truth, if the world would go away, uh, I can think of a lot of things I'd much rather, rather do than be involved in political activism. I don't particularly enjoy it. You know, I don't like big groups. I don't even like talking to big groups. I'm sorry, I apologize. But uh, I certainly don't like to go to meetings. I hate to go to jail. I don't like to be maced. You know, it's, uh, 
I mean, uh, demonstrations I can't stand and so on. But, uh, uh, I mean, that's the honest truth. But they're just, you know, they're just things you have to do. I mean, they take a look at the, you don't, it doesn't take any imagination, you know. All it takes is to have your eyes open, you know, to see that uh, really awful things are going on in the world. You can start at arm's length. You don't have to go very far. Just take a walk downtown. It's enough. Actually, take a walk to Kendall Square and look, look at what's happening you know, people begging for food and so on. Uh, and then you can go far off to the rest of the world and find more. In fact, if you have a little imagination, uh, you can think about uh, uh, what kind of a world we're, we'll be leaving to future generations who don't have any voice. Uh, it doesn't seem to me possible to pay attention to those things, or to be alive, you know, and not to be aware of all of that. And it doesn't seem possible to be aware of it and not to try to do something about it, even if you don't enjoy it. And mostly I don't, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Although there are satisfactions, plenty of satisfactions. I mean, most worthwhile causes, I think, I, I assume, are going to fail. Uh, because they're worthwhile because they're struggles against power and authority. And the way the world works is it runs, unfortunately, mostly by force. Uh, there's people called intellectuals who try to explain that in their own country, in their own institutions, it isn't like that. Uh, but uh, it's just not true. And that means that most things that are worth doing are going to involve a large measure of failure, sometimes disastrous failure, uh, because you're running up against powerful and brutal forces. Uh, sometimes there's a degree of success. I mean, over a long period, I think you can see general progress. And some of the activities have, uh, you can see specific progress, even particular people that are helped and groups that are helped and so on. But it's small successes, hard work. Uh, I don't particularly find it, you know, it wouldn't be my first choice if I was just thinking how to, you know, sort of be happy. I'd much rather be in my study working, to tell you the truth. Uh, but. Uh, it's, there's no choice, as far as I can see. There's no choice if you want to be able to look yourself in the mirror, at least. Variously defined as, as the 60s, the 70s, or the revolution, or the counterculture, that 30 years that followed the end of World War II has taken on mythic proportions. Nowadays, books, films, TV productions, and popular culture have revived interest in that era's movements, fashions, music, and politics. What stands out to you as, as significant about that time? Actually, I think the most significant things about that period, uh, <clears throat> many of them were written by the people who were most outraged by it. And, uh, uh, organized uh, a, a very significant counterattack, which we've been living with ever since, to, over, to uh, destroy everything that was achieved then. And they're pretty articulate and reasonably intelligent. Uh, and some of them have published things you really ought to read. Everybody ought to read. I was teaching undergraduate courses here for about 25 years on political topics, on, off on my own time, a lot of fun. But one thing we always had students read was uh, after it came, as soon as it came out, uh, was a book called The Crisis of Democracy, uh, which was the first publication of the Trilateral Commission. It was published in 1975. The uh, Trilateral Commission was founded by David Rockefeller, and it brought together trilateral because it brought together elite elements from the three, what's called the triad, you know, Japan, the United States, and Europe, uh, three rich areas. Uh, these were mostly liberal elites, incidentally. It's the group of people who were around the Carter administration. In fact, the Carter administration was drawn entirely from that group, including Carter. So it gives you roughly their political complexion. They were scared to death by what happened in the 60s. Uh, the crisis of democracy, and they're very frank about it. It was, meant, it was not meant to be read. It was, in fact, as soon as people started reading it, I noticed it went off the market. But uh, the, uh, it was meant to be sort of an internal discussion among sort of smart guys. The American rapporteur was from a big professor at Harvard. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, what terrified them, and they're very frank about it because it's in basically an internal document, uh, is, uh, uh, is the fact that during the 1960s, uh, 
uh, great masses of people who are ordinarily apathetic and obedient and you know do what they're told and don't get anybody's hair and so on s became organized and politicized and started to think for themselves and uh, uh, f find their own ways of living uh, challenge authority uh, or put forth their demands in the political arena that really drove them up the wall that's the crisis of democracy uh, and uh, uh, the institutions were no longer working anymore. Uh, in fact, what they called the institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young, you know, meaning universities, schools, uh, churches, and so on. The universities that were responsible for the indoctrination of the young were not doing their job. The young were getting out of control. They were, you know, challenging authority. They were getting interested in crazy stuff like truth and justice and <laughs> freedom and you know, all that kind of business uh, and actually trying to do something about it and they, what's more they were really changing the country I mean the country really changed it's a very different and much more civilized country than it used to be in the uh, early 1960s in many many respects and this was extremely frightening to elite groups uh, including liberal elites, and the, uh, their proposals were to, to try to find ways to beat back this uh, challenge, uh, to try to, as the American Harvard professor put it, uh, to restore the good old days, uh, as he, descri he described it with a little bit of exaggeration. He said back in the days of the Truman years, uh, Truman was able to govern the country with the help of a few Wall Street lawyers and financiers. Sorry for the I'm attack on lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> so th in those days, few Wall Street lawyers and bankers or something like that could run the country, but in the 60s, this was all getting out of control. I mean, all this rabble is getting around, this mass of people who aren't supposed to be doing anything, they're just supposed to be following orders. And we have to restore indoctrination and passivity and apathy. And there's been, in fact, from that time, a major doctrinal attack against, uh, uh, against the, an assault on the universities uh, and a, a very strong effort to narrow even further the rather narrow spectrum of kind of respectable discussion, you know, the media and so on. Uh, at the same time, there's been a struggle against it. But what they were pointing to is quite real. I mean, all of those things were happening. Uh, they happened in a very exciting way. They, very, they happened, it was mostly young people. Uh, the, uh, this, there, there had been the same attack. This, was a re this is a cycle that we keep going through in American history. So the, 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 uh, the, tw the 1920s were an extremely apathetic period. In fact, the labor movement was totally smashed, mostly by violence at that time. Uh, during, uh, and the, the place looked, com looked like the end of history. You know, everybody was talking about wonderful, it's all over, everybody follows orders, the rich guys get richer, and so on. The 1930s broke that up, you know, it was a, a period of active activism on all fronts, really changed things. Immediately afterwards, in fact, by the late 30s, there was something like, there was a major assault on it. Uh, that's the McCarthyism. It was kind of held off by the war for a couple of years, but then it picked up steam right in the late 40s. It's called McCarthyism, but McCarthy was a late comer. Uh, and in fact, in my opinion, not all that important. I mean, the main things were going on, again, often led by liberal elites, well before McCarthy and much more destructive. And it, the 50s became very quiet and apathetic, not as bad as the 20s, but pretty bad. And again, there were a lot of predictions. It's all over, everything's in order, you know, nobody's gonna bother us anymore. And then the 60s came along, blew it out of the water, terrified the same groups. Salt starts over again, you know, we beat back the crisis of democracy. We're living in the middle of that reaction now. Uh, those the things that they were worried about were real and important. And uh, they made the country more free, more just, more honest. Uh, they just, they even cha they changed styles. I mean, like take say MIT. You know, back in 1960, nobody would be dressed like this. You know, I would be, I was wearing a coat, a jacket, and a tie, and, you know, students were respect, respectful, and, uh, you know, <laughs> I didn't say respectable, you know, and, and those things are not just symbols. First of all, there were no women, you know, like this, very few women, no, no, pe no people of color, you know, it's a nice, uh, it was, uh, uh, it, it was like your image of the 1950s, that's what it re really was. Uh, these changes from uh, dress style to personal relations to uh, respect for other cultures, 
cultures, you know, to concern for rights. To, uh, all of these things were perfectly real. They made the country a lot more civilized. Uh, they've resisted the attack. The assault has been very significant, but it's been resisted. Uh, and, but I think if you ask what were the 60s about, yeah, I think exactly what uh, scandalized uh, respectable people. That's what the 60s were about. I grew up in the 60s. I went to high school. I think I started in 1959. I started college in 1963. I got married in 1967. I had children in 69 and 70. So this is like from 15 to 25. That's that period of time, that decade. And then, um, so my, my sense of it is quite different in the sense that I didn't, I was, Actually, I thought I was in the, the baby boomer until I read some magazine that said, oh no, you have to be born in 46, so I guess I'm not quite a baby boomer. But um, there was a huge thrust of people about the same age going into educational institutes at the same time in a level and at a pace that had never happened before. And that's true of blacks and whites. And so to me, the thing that is significant is what I will refer to as the student movement. But the student movement is a uh, very powerful and very diffuse thing because the student population was the largest cohort that had ever in history been in college in the United States. So you have movements of students in black colleges, for example, who are challenging the extraordinarily authoritarian structure of that college. You had students at white universities who were challenging the authoritarian structure of their college after having been participants, let's say, in a civil rights summer led by students who had joined the Civil Rights Movement, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, CORE, some other group. The student movement was the base out of which the anti-war movement, that was the mass movement, not the, there was anti-war movements and pacifist movements in this country from quite some time ago, but the mass movement of anti-war protests came out of the student movement and the women's movement came out of the student movement. All the women who were involved in what became women's movement or women's liberation were women who were just as educated as these men who were in the same organizations they were in and the men were always taking leadership positions and the women were taking notes. And some of the women began to say, well, why do I have to listen to you? My education is just as good. And the women's movement upset uh, quite a bit of the, uh, emotional stability of men in, in the radical movements. Um, I think uh, it was Todd Gitlin who wrote that the era of the late 60s and early 70s was, he said it was exhilarating for women and very horrible for men or something like that. And uh, I couldn't quite figure out what his problem was until I realized that he was one of the men who was in a position of leadership in an organization that was working along old rules even though it was supposed to be new left. So the thing though to me that stands out as significant, as the most significant, as if this did not happen you would not have that era called the 60s or the 70s. We would not have the explosion of imaginative music and literature and theater. The thing that triggered it for me was the Vietnam War on the one hand. That's a foreign event, but it has so many profound internal consequences for the United States, which I will start in 1954. I mean, that's at the point in which the French are defeated in Indochina and the American begin, America begins to uh, take on a military and political role of sustaining uh, a, a different type of government in Vietnam and, and, and supporting the anti-communists. And the reason I picked that date, 1954, is because the other very significant thing was the Brown decision by the United States Supreme Court that was also handed down in 1954, taking the position for the first time in 105 years, I believe, since Plessy. The Plessy decision says uh, se separation 
a separate but equal facilities, racial lines are constitutional. The Brown decision says segregation in education is unconstitutional. And the way that was interpreted, interpreted in black communities was with exuberance and exhilaration as the Supreme Court has said segregation is unconstitutional. It is said in education, but it was interpreted and the civil rights movement, the modern civil rights movement leaped I mean, from that day, from the May 19th, or what date that decision was made, the movement took off. And so those two events interacting within the context of the United States gave it a dynamic, gave it a sense of purpose, a sense of possibility, also a sense of horror. I was in a movement that was very internationalist and looked at liberation struggles in Africa, liberation struggles in Asia, in China, in Cuba, and continually said if the Vietnamese can win their independence from the United States, if they can fight against the most powerful military behemoth in the world, so can we. And so that kind of dynamic and that kind of willingness to risk your life and put everything on the line to change that the Vietnam War allowed, I think significantly altered all the other uh, possible struggles, and it generated such internal dissension and protest among whites that the whole cultural hierarchy fell apart and has been put back together, but it's not the same. Thank you. Students often ask me um, what happened, why did, we, why did the 60s stop? That's sort of the question they ask. What happened to the 60s? And I always say, um, and, and, and also, I've been, uh, students have said to me, why did you all give up? And I've often said that um, I don't think the movement stopped voluntarily. Um, and so I want to ask the question about the uh, government's counter, uh, COINTELPRO, we call it COINTELPRO, but it's counterintelligence program that um, was directed at that era and, and, the, and the individuals who were operating in that era and the groups that were uh, 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 most active in that era and ask each of you how did the COINTELPRO program, and you can of course elaborate on it a little bit more and explain it a little bit more than I have right now, how did, how did that program affect both of you? You got more dramatic stories than I think. <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, the idea that this, let me just start with the kind of presupposition. Uh, the idea that the 60s came to an end is completely wrong. I mean, if you think of the movements, if you think, sorry, I was saying that the idea that the 60s movements ended is completely false. In fact, that's propaganda. It's part of the propaganda that is trying and so far failing uh, to get people back to passivity and uh, obedience. Uh, if you just think back, I mean, the, uh, you know, some of you are too young to remember, but you know anyway. Uh, if you think of the movements that have really had a major effect on, America, on the life and the culture and the society and you know, the way we act with one another and so on and so forth, they're movements of the 70s, not of the 60s. Uh, the feminist movement, as Kathleen said, that's a movement of the 70s. Uh, and that's probably had a... a maybe a broader effect on the whole culture than anything else I can think of. The environmental movements are movements of the 70s. They barely, nothing existed in the 60s. Uh, the uh, uh, name, and that's, uh, you know, there's a, there's a kind of a deep moral thrust behind that. It's saying we care about the world that's going to exist in the future, you know, not just for ourselves, but what it means for other people, you know, people who don't have a, a vote in the marketplace, if you want to use that ridiculous uh, idiom. Uh, one of the many respects in which it's a grotesque system. But uh, the, uh, 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 the solidarity, I mean, let's take even the, anti, the anti-war movement, the Vietnam anti-war movement. It was a very important thing. I mean, I spent a lot of time and effort and suffering and so on in it. Uh, and. Uh, was pretty close to going to jail for a long time, in fact, missed by a miracle. But despite all that, let me just tell you that the Vietnam War movement, anti-war movement, was very small as compared with the solidarity movements of the 1980s. So, for example, in the 1960s, nobody dreamed of going to live in a Vietnamese village. 
uh, in the hope that a white face might limit the uh, uh, violence of uh, the state terrorists that the U.S. was organizing or U.S. forces themselves. Could have had, you know, it might well have limited the violence, but it's not an idea that even occurred to anyone. Well, you know, thousands of people did that in the 1980s. Uh, not people from the left particularly. A lot of them were coming from, you know, Midwestern Christian fundamentalist groups. Uh, but there was just a sense that uh, the, the United States was carrying out a violent terrorist war in the 1980s, uh, ma mainly targeting the church, in fact. Uh, the, the church, uh, or, uh, popular organizations, and so on, that's part of the attack on the crisis of democracy had spread to Central America. And there you do it a little more harshly than you do here, you know. Uh, and it was very brutal. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed. It was monstrous and so on. It would have been a lot worse if the opposition to it had been only at the level of the 60s. Uh, they could never send B-52s. They had to organize uh, an international terror network instead of sending U.S. military forces directly. Uh, and it was because of the turmoil and the ferment and the literal participation. I mean, there were tens of thousands of people from here who went down to see what was going on and share the lives of the people, maybe protect them, help, and so on. Nothing like that was even conceivable in the 1960s. Uh, the difference is quite dramatic. Uh, and. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, so these, these movements lasted, not only lasted, but they grew and they expanded and they continued and still going on, you know, uh, in the, in the mid at the peak of the anti-war movement, say 1965, 1966, you could not conceivably have had a group not only like this, you couldn't have filled a classroom at MIT with people interested in these things. Let me tell you from experience. Uh, when we were trying to have mo uh, meetings against the Vietnam War at places like MIT and Harvard, incidentally, in the mid-60s, uh, we would put together a half a dozen issues. You know, the Vietnam War, Vietnam, Venezuela, you know, Iran, uh, you know, the price of <laughs> bread. I mean, maybe you figure if you get... <laughs> Ten issues, you know, you might be able to get uh, 20 people to come out uh, and maybe listen. I mean, when I started giving talks, there were it was, there were literally the I mean, I give a talk in a church, you know, with four people there, you know, uh, the guy who organized it, some, you know, some guy was out in the streets and was cold, uh, and two people who wanted to kill you, you know, that's uh, and uh, in fact, uh, Boston's a pretty liberal city, you know, but uh, uh, as late as mid-1966, that's when there were hundreds of thousands of American troops in Vietnam, and the country was virtually devastated, you know, killed hundreds of thousands of people. And I, at that time, we could not have a public meeting against the war in Boston. You couldn't have a meeting at the Boston Common or at the Arlington Street Church, even in a church, because it would simply be attacked by counter-demonstrators, violently attacked by counter-demonstrators, many of them students, incidentally, you know, marching over from the colleges to destroy it, with the applause of the press, including the liberal press. Uh, now, th that's what the world was like at the, at the peak of the Vietnam War. It changed dramatically, and a lot of it changed because of the movements of the 70s and the 80s. You know, these things remained. They fought off the attempts at repression. They've been growing. The belief that it's collapsed is simply false. Anybody who's been, thinks about what's happened knows that's not true. Well, that's kind of only on your first sentence. No, on no, COINTELPRO. Because yeah. that actually is part of the, what you're saying is the COINTELPRO. Well, COINTELPRO, yeah. right. COINTELPRO is a very significant thing. And uh, you should, again, if you don't know about it, you should learn about it. It's a thousand times more significant than, say, Watergate. I mentioned Watergate because the expose of COINTELPRO and of Watergate was just about exactly at the same time. Uh, in comparison to COINTELPRO, Watergate was just a, was a tea party. Uh, the only reason why anybody pays attention to Watergate is the targets were rich, powerful people. And rich, powerful people fight back, you know, like the, you, the you know, head of the Ford Foundation and the president and the, the CEO of IBM and those guys, or the, the Democratic Party, which is, after all, half of the power in the country, uh, you fiddle around with them, they get rid of you. you know, they're powerful and rich. And that's considered a scandal to go after, uh, to say, to, 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 to uh, uh, nothing incidentally happened at Watergate. For example, everybody was totally scandalized by Nixon's enemies list, you know. 
pages all of I mean I was on Nixon's enemies list you know. <laughs> they never even audited my income tax I mean you know it's a meaningless totally meaningless thing uh, but the point is rich powerful not me of course but you know rich powerful people were on Nixon's enemies list so it was a scandal I mean the break-in of the Democratic Party headquarters uh, you know, nobody even knows what it was for, you know. It was a couple of sort of, you know, uh, crooks who were gathered together for some unknown purpose who did nothing, you know. Uh, I mean, if you, be, uh, but it became a huge scandal because they were powerful people they were attacking. Let's turn to COINTELPRO. Uh, COINTELPRO, was, which was revealed at the same time, it's the very same time. Not, in, not, not, not very little in the press or anywhere else. It came out in the, in the courts, you know, uh, Freedom of Information Act. Mostly courts just released documents. Well, it turns out that for since the Eisenhower administration and right up till Nixon, the government had been the government. It's not a you know it's not a little group of people uh, put together by Nixon when he was drunk or something. But the federal government, through four administrations, were running a, a terrorist program against dissent literally a terrorist program, major terrorist program. I mean, it started, uh, it's the, it began against the Communist Party back in the 50s. Under Kennedy, it really took off. Uh, the uh, it, uh, Puerto Rican nationalists, uh, other groups, and so on, the, what they called black nationalists quickly became a target. Panthers in particular were devastated by it. The women's movement as a whole was attacked as soon as it began to come into existence. The new left across the board. Uh, in fact, there was virtually nothing that was left out. Uh, maybe the Panthers were the most, you know, the most viciously attacked. At the time, according, we now know a lot from released documents. Uh, at the time, according to the FBI, the Panthers had 800 members. But they were devoting enormous efforts to destroy the party because it was doing things like running free breakfast programs in churches and things like that. And it reached the level of outright political assassination. Uh, the literal political, Gestapo-style political assassination. Uh, the main, the person who was, you know, the, the most extreme case uh, in the COINTELPRO records was uh, the assassination of Black Panther leader Fred Hampton, who's an organizer in the Chicago ghettos. Now, they were not going after him because he was a criminal or anything else. He was anything but. He was a very effective organizer. That's the kind of guy they want to kill. Uh, they tried, the FBI tried to get a uh, criminal gang in the ghetto, uh, Blackstone Rangers. They tried to incite the Rangers to kill him by sending uh, faked letters. I mean, you read the letters. They're so idiotic. I don't think no, I understand. remember those letters, did you? I don't know how they could imagine that anybody would believe they were, you know, got some FBI agent putting on black dialect or something, you know, dear brothers. <laughs> it was kind of like, I mean, if it hadn't been so awful, it would have been a comic strip. Uh, but uh, the idea was to try to get the Rangers to believe that the Panthers had a contract out to kill their leaders and then they'd go kill them. Well, that didn't work. So the, uh, they just took it over directly. They, uh, it was a combined operation of the FBI and the Chicago police, which simply went in and murdered them. Four o'clock in the morning, you know, probably drugged, killed a couple other people. Uh, there was an attempt to cover it up, but couldn't keep, you know, came out in the courts. I mean, there's no doubt about what happened. Uh, you know, in comparison with this, what's Watergate? You know, in fact, one of the most, one of the minor elements of, of COINTELPRO, really minor, uh, was an attack on a political party. A political party which is every bit as legitimate as the Democratic Party, Socialist Workers Party. Uh, all the rights of the Democratic Party, right? Only one difference between the Socialist Party and the Democratic, the Democratic Socialist Workers Party and the Democratic Party. Socialist Workers Party is a few powerless people. The Democratic Party is half the wealth in the country. Well, uh, in the case of the Socialist Workers Party, they didn't send in some, you know, Keystone cops to s steal some documents for no known reason. Uh, they went, the FBI, which is the National Political Police, went after them and tried to destroy them. They robbed their offices, they stole their records, they black tried to blacklist, get employers to blacklist their members. They tried to destroy the party. I mean, infinitely worse than anything that happened to the Democrats. Anybody care? No? I mean, does anybody know about COINTELPRO and as compared with Watergate? No, and that tells you something about the elite culture that we're all trained in and brought up in when we get our degrees at Harvard and so on. Uh, what matters is if you do things to people with power. That's bad. 
if you do infinitely worse things to powerless people, doesn't even merit a footnote in history. Uh, and you just look at the coverage of these two events, which came out at the same time, and it makes it very clear. Incidentally, uh, MIT was also targeted by COINTEL Pro. This is pretty minor, I should say, as compared with the things that Kathleen can tell you about or that I just mentioned. It's nothing, but uh, the FBI did try to disrupt uh, courses at MIT, mine. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Incidentally, whether any of this stuff ever happened, I don't know, but it's in the F M FBI records. Uh, they were re the government was required under court order around 1980, I guess, to uh, release documents to people who were targeted by illegal COINTELPRO Co Pro activities. I don't have to add illegal because they're all radically illegal. Uh, so in the course of that, we got some documents. My Louis Kampf, who many of you know, and I were teaching courses, I, I think I mentioned, for many years here. And they tried to disrupt them. We had a lot of students, and there were assistants, and some of the assistants were people who had been active in the civil rights movement and the student movement and so on. Uh, and uh, the first document, you know, got a set of documents. First one comes from the Boston FBI office to J. Edgar Hoover in Washington saying, our source within MIT and then comes a black line. <laughs> we spent a lot of time trying to de decipher. <laughs> but our source, with, uh, if you've ever looked at these documents, they're half blacked out. Our source within MIT tells us that uh, you know, these student assistants, these bad guys are teaching in this course. This is a good opportunity for a disinformation effort and to try to undermine it and get rid of them and so on and so forth uh, and disrupt the course and so on. And they need authorization from Washington. They get authorization from Washington. And then, you know, it goes up and back for a lot of boring communications. And the last one says, our source within MIT, you know, blank, uh, tells us that our operation was a terrific success. I mean, we got rid of these guys, you know, the whole thing's... Uh, wrecked and so on and so forth. Uh, well, you know, that is such a tiny footnote to COINTEL Pro. I'm embarrassed even to mention it. Uh, I do because it's close to home. But this was a, you know, it's a major project. Uh, theoretically, it was ended when it was exposed. I don't see any reason to believe that it was ended. Uh, the, uh, but it's because, you know, that it's just not uh, maybe they going on under some other name or something. Uh, well, that's uh, COINTEL Pro. It was no joke. Uh, the, uh, you know, I th think things, it, people were killed. Uh, the worst case was the Hampton assassination. Lives were destroyed. Uh, and it was a major attack on, on dissent, any kind of dissent, across the board by the end. Uh, and uh, it had its effect. It certainly disrupted and harmed plenty of people, killed some. Uh, I think in the case of the Panthers, it probably destroyed them. You know. uh, the, uh, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's one thing for rich white folks like us to you know, say, OK, you laugh at it when they do this stuff to us. It's quite different if you're a poor, defenseless person in the ghetto. Very different. Uh, and uh, uh, it had its effects. But uh, to say that it ru ruined the movement is just not, it did ruin a lot of things. It probably it may have very seriously harmed the black movement. Uh, but uh, other things c continued and, in fact, grew and expanded, and they can continue to. Well, I'll talk a little bit about what COINTELPRO was only in terms of the FBI, but the concept of counterintelligence was much broader than the FBI. We focused in on the FBI because they were the most visible and the things they did were the closest to us. But for example, let's take a city like Los Angeles. There's the FBI racial squad that's operating to get rid of black radicals and revolutionaries and they focus in on the Black Panthers. In the Los Angeles Police Department, there is the criminal conspiracy squad and they're focus is to get rid of black radicals, in particular black panthers. So they work together. And in the Central Intelligence Agency, they have their own particular units doing the same thing. In the Department of Defense Intelligence, they have their units doing thing. In the National Security Agency, they have their units doing the same thing. And so what we didn't know, we said yes, it was a police state and they were out to get us. But what we had no idea was the amount of agencies and the amount of money and the amount of technology that was used to destroy us. But just look at one particular individual, a young man named Elmer Geronimo Pratt, who 
was discharged from the United States Army in, I think, about 1968, took his GI Bill, went to UCLA as in a program called High Potential to get a college degree. Uh, he met another Black Panther named Al Prentice Bunchy Carter in that program. Carter recruited him into the Black Panther Party. And within, um, within seven months, Al Prentice Carter was murdered on the UCLA campus after a black student meeting by uh, Carter and John Huggins were murdered on the uh, UCLA campus after a black student meeting to discuss who was going to run the uh, African American, I think at that time they call it Black Studies Program. The university had picked someone named Ron Karenga. The students felt that they should be included in the decision making and, and invited a couple of Panthers to this meeting. Bunchy Carter told all the Panthers before they came to the meeting, look, we're not in any kind of conflict with Karenga. We don't have anything against him. We're only going there because the students ask us and no one should bring any weapons. So this is a very calm, unexciting student meeting, at the end of which an incident is provoked by someone in us saying something to a woman named Elaine Brown who had ties with the Black Panther Party. She says something to John Huggins. Gunfire ensues. Two Panthers are dead. Uh, the FBI agent who wrote about it, a man named Wes Schweringen, who has subsequently revealed a lot of his uh, information in a book called FBI Secrets, says the agents came back, the two FBI agents plus the two blacks in the US organization who were their infiltrators, came back upset, saying that wasn't supposed to happen. There wasn't supposed to be any shooting on the campus. And the reason why? They weren't supposed to be killed on the campus because some white students might have been killed in the gunfire. They were supposed to have been killed, but somewhere else. So that's just one little January 1969 incident, an example of counterintelligence work within the Black Panther Party, against the Black Panther Party. And the purpose was not only to kill the leadership of a particular branch, it was very powerful, but to also instigate conflict and warfare between two different and or you might say rival black activist nationalist groups. Now that's a microcosm. What was going on across the country was equally if not more vicious. That happened uh, seven months I believe before the, no, a year before. Fred Hampton was murdered in, Jan in December of 69 and Carter was murdered in January. Some of the groups for example that the FBI was spying on, infiltrating, and collecting information on for its so-called agitator index. And if you're on the agitator index, certain uh, things would happen to you under different circumstances. But these are the organizations they looked at. American Nazi Party, anti-Vietnam activists, black nationalists, Black Panther Party, communists, Congress of Racial Equality, Ku Klux Klan, Latin American. That's there. This is uh, out of the uh, Select Committee report on the intelligence activities, otherwise known as the Church Committee. Minutemen, Nation of Islam, National States Right Party, Progressive Labor Party, Nationalist Groups Advocating Independence for Puerto Rico, Revolutionary Action Movement, Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Students for a Democratic Society, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, Socialist Workers Party, Workers World Party, and then there's another one called miscellaneous. <laughs> now, those are just some of the groups they're looking at. They ha hey, had programs involving the CIA operating domestically. They had programs involving the CIA operating internationally. I remember reading in the New York Times while I was doing some research as a student about a particular program under, you know, when all the reporting about Watergate was going on, that the same little crew that initiated the Watergate break-in had initiated break-ins into the Guinea Embassy. The purpose of breaking into the, Gimbus, the Embassy of Guinea was because that country represented Algeria in the United States. Algeria and the United States did not have diplomatic relations. The Black Panther Party had an international section in Algeria. The Nixon White House was convinced that the Algerian government was financing not only the Black Panther Party but other movements and wanted proof of this finance. And the CIA had informed him, no, they're not being financed. And he wouldn't believe it. So they had three break-ins into the Guinea Embassy to get 
proof of this finance. And there were over and over, people would visit you, people would interact with you, they would send letters to you. I got letters all the time, and I was so busy I didn't read most of them, but they tried to disrupt your relationships with other people. For example, I got a letter that said, um, Dear Kathleen, you are such a nice person. I hate to be the one to break this bad news, but I just want you to know your husband is having an affair with a white woman who lives at such and such and such a street and had an address. And then it was signed, a soul sister. <laughs> so I said, <laughs> I said, if you won't tell me who you are, why should I believe you? And I threw it away. I mentioned to William Kunstler, uh, very, very uh, uh, dynamic lawyer, uh, that incident, they're just in passing, and he said, yeah, my wife got those kind of letters too, but she believes them all. <laughs> <laughs> and so they did all sorts of little insidious, petty things to make you not trust the people you lived with, to break up marriages, to destroy people by killing them, to destroy people by having them arrested, to destroy people by making you think that they were a police agent when they weren't. There was a vast array of techniques done, uh, climates created, harassment used, and this is on top of just everyday regular arrests and trials and poverty. So uh, what happened, people were beaten down, and I always say we did not disappear, we did not go out of existence, we were destroyed. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if the individuals, all the individuals were not destroyed. What was destroyed was their link, their organizational structure, their newspapers, and even more importantly, the links with other organizations. For example, in Chicago, Fred Hampton had created something called the Rainbow Coalition. And it brought together a white organization, radical group called the Young Patriots. Uh, Chicano, I'm sorry, Puerto Rican group called the Young Lords, an Asian group, the Iwar Kun, or the Red Guards, uh, the Blackstone Rangers, and the Black Panthers. And we had other similar coalitions in the Bay Area. We had coalitions with the Peace and Freedom Party, which is an electoral organization, predominantly white, and the Brown Berets, which are a Chicano group, and the Iwar Kun, an Asian group. So when you have radical revolutionary groups pulling together, challenging racism, working together and you destroy those organizational links, even if the people are still in the same place, their movements aren't. And even if the people are physically there, they don't trust people anymore. So you destroy the motion even though you don't destroy the people. Ooh, that brought me back in time for myself. What have each of you learned from the other's work? Very simple question. <laughs> uh, I, I always believe in deep, depersonalizing questions, if you don't mind. The important thing is not what one person learned from another person, but what you learn from the kinds of activities and organizations that other people are involved in. So can I change the question? Okay. Uh, the, <laughs> yeah. Because, uh, uh, you know, uh, otherwise it's just like individual accident. You know, it's not, doesn't have any general meaning. Uh, well, I mean, I w uh, so let's take the Panthers, say. Uh, or uh, I, I, um, I, I was in, at the time that the Panthers became visible, which, what was that, 66 or so? Around 66. Also, I think 67? Yeah, around then, 66, 67. At that time, I was uh, extensively involved with a, a group that I'd helped organize. It was, and still exists, and actually has its offices here in Boston. Uh, it's it's start, uh, called Resist, which was uh, it was the first and major uh, resistance uh, a, a group of people involved in resistance or supporting resistance. We were a bit older, like we were in our 40s, so, so a lot of it was resistance support. You know, uh, re some of it was direct resistance, like organizing tax resistance and the kinds of things we could do directly, uh, and all sorts of other activities. But it was a resistance support, a resistance group and a resistance support group actually was brought to trial in the Spock, Spock case, if you remember that. Uh, the, uh, uh, by the time, by 66 and 67, by the time the Panthers, you know, were sort of visible on the scene, the group had extended its interests. 
It had a, the, a large number of, the participants were activists of all kinds from around the country. And a number of them were people who did, who worked mostly in the urban ghettos. So we were sort of hearing things from the inside about what was going on at our annual monthly meetings. Uh, the uh, uh, people from the group have gone all sorts of ways. One, I regret to say, a good friend has been in jail for 20 years, uh, a wonderful person, and others, various things happened to. Uh, but we did sort of know what was going on from direct participation, and then of course we could follow, and we decided that as our interests were spreading to many other activities beyond uh, specifically resistance to the war in Vietnam, which is what it started with, that we ought to do something, you know, this was something we ought to become involved in. Uh, and I myself and others started trying to become involved at that time. Now, I don't want to exaggerate, you know, I'm not going to organize workers in the G, a GE factory in Lynn, and I'm not going to organize people in Roxbury. I mean, that's not me, you know. Uh, but we were a solidarity group. You know, we f figured there are things that we can do that would be helpful and supportive uh, using our own privilege. I mean, we were very privileged, most of us, certainly me. Extremely privileged, way more than we ought to be. And we can use it, you know. You can use it in a lot of ways. You can use it uh, to give material support. You can use it to give, uh, you have intellectual resources that aren't available to people who are less privileged. You can just be there. That makes a difference. Uh, you can participate in ways which can, for example, reduce violence or, or uh, can, you know, help activities go on and so on. So we became involved as a kind of a solidarity group, kind of like third world solidarity groups, you know, in Central America or Africa or whatever, except this one was right at home, including Boston. And that continued uh, until, at least in my personal for me personally, until the Hampton assassination. Uh, my own last direct participation was to fly out to Chicago at the request of friends and a family of his to be at the funeral. Uh, and uh, it was not a happy occasion. Uh, the, uh, uh, when I came back here, I gave a talk in Kresge, in fact, and there were a fair number of people about it. And we tried to do some more things, but uh, by then, I th at that time, I think the attack on the Panthers had been sufficiently successful, so they really couldn't recover. Uh, and uh, that's when my connections essentially you know, uh, uh, dropped aside from continuing to uh, write about it and speak about it. And I was involved with the family during the trials and that kind of thing. But uh, that's just my personal involvement. <laughs> I was in Paris. My former husband had left Algeria. The international section was uh, asked, was disbanded, and we were living in France. I'm not sure whether we were there legally or illegally at the time. And a book was published in France that Chomsky wrote that had been banned or not allowed to be released in the United States. And in France, the title was Ban de Sang, which is bloodbath. And it was a, a protest against an condemnation of the kind of uh, war activities that we ourselves protested. And I just, re I always remember that this just very gory title and his name as someone who was singular in their concentrated attack on the same things that we were up against, but he attacked them in a way that was a little, probably a little more respectable and more researched than we did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I like the name, and I, I, could, I always, re, I, I was going to tell you, that I've moved, I don't know how many times, let's say 55 times since then. I just pack up and move, pack for various reasons, go to school, change jobs, whatever, get away from this person or that person. <laughs> but um, one of your books always seems to end up in yeah, my house. Probably about five copies. <laughs> no, of this is uh, uh, the Mandarins. But um, I've actually stolen books of his or borrowed books of his from other people <laughs> so I could read them, uh, never return them. So it, what I would, if I had to describe the influence, I would uh, use the language that he stands, other people would agree with me, he stands like a beacon or like a lighthouse out over a sea of hogwash that you've been told. <laughs> This stuff. That's not true. So thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, 
beacon over a sea of hogwash. <laughs> Remember that. Um, actually, there there are two. I'll I'll combine two last questions, and then we need to open up so that people can ask questions from the audience. Um, the, I'll I'll kind of. I think that. No, no, I'm trying to make. Well, I think that the, we only have. Um, we're about now at the one hour mark, so we. Huh? Uh, huh? Longer? We have longer. Don't worry about it. The race day in the year 2000, since they had so much experience in the background. We're not, we're not quite at questions yet. We're, we'll, we'll be there in just a second. We're just going to ask, I'll ask one more question then. Okay. Huh? Okay. What do you see as the major challenges facing young people now, uh, uh, young people uh, to, of today when they attempt to bring about social change and try to, you know, elaborate on that in, in whatever way that would be helpful for the people in the audience? Well, I mean, if I, uh, the challenges, I think, uh, you know, you don't want me to tell you about them. Uh, if you look around near you, far away, the future, and so on, you're going to find, if you're honest, uh, lots of needless suffering and oppression. Uh, while we're having this meeting, uh, if you believe UNICEF statistics, uh, a couple of thousand uh, children will die of uh, malnutrition and disease who could be saved for probably a few cents a day. I mean, not serious things. And maybe twice that many women will die or uh, be seriously maimed from pregnancy-related or childbirth-related injuries, all because they don't have f facilities that could easily be made available. That's just while we're meeting, you know. Uh, uh, thousands and thousands of people. You don't have to go very far from here to see it. I mean, I've walked through streets in Harlem, which were as horrifying as anything I've seen in the third world, and I've been to some of the poorest and most depressed parts of the third world. Uh, you look elsewhere, you find more. There is endless misery and suffering, and it's needless. Uh, it's there because our, our institutional structures are catastrophic failures. That's why it's there. Uh, you see it, uh, you ask yourself, you recognize it, you ask yourself why it's there. There takes analysis, you know, you want to understand what's going on and why. Uh, and then you simply uh, ask what you can do about it. And the range of things you can do is endless, you know. I mean, if you don't feel like doing anything yourself, you can help other people who are doing things. Or you can become involved in, in indefinitely many ways. I mean, I won't insult your intelligence by the, trying to describe them. Uh, it, uh, and it's a very individual matter. It depends. You know, I know people have taken very different tracks, very honorable tracks. And my own children, for that matter, and elsewhere, but very different ones. Uh, and it's a matter of you have to work it out for yourself. You know, there's no right answer, at least that I know. Uh, nor are there any techniques. I mean, for th you know, throughout all of human history, these struggles have been going on, and they've been successful. Uh, you know, the world is not very pleasant, but you don't have to go back very far when it was a lot more unpleasant. Uh, it's like we don't have slavery, literal slavery. Uh, uh, jails are bad, you know, but not very long ago, uh, civilized countries like Norway didn't have a lot of people in prison. Uh, the reason was that uh, if a person robbed a store or something, you'd drive a stake through his hand, you know, then you didn't need prisons. Uh, and uh, we don't have to go very far back to see these things. Uh, a century ago, maybe the worst human being that human history has ever created, at least I can't think of anyone worse, was Joseph Mengele. It was monstrous experiments under the Nazi period. You go back a hundred years, right here in Boston, uh, highly respected uh, doctors were carrying out Mengele-type experiments. Uh, their pictures are on the walls in Harvard Med School. Mengele-type experiments on uh, Irish indigent women and black women. Uh, devising the techniques that are now used in gynecological surgery. You take a woman, you keep doing experiment after experiment and so on, and nothing was considered wrong about that. You know, it was just like part of the culture. You go back 40 years and elementary things like, you know, just ordinary respect for women's rights didn't exist. It's just in, like, our lifetimes, you know. Uh, and you can make progress. There are a lot of things you can do, but it's never going to be easy. As I said, you have to expect that most worthwhile efforts are going to mostly fail. Uh, if they're worthwhile, they are confronting uh, 
power, power and authority, uh, and hence could very well fail and probably will, but there's a measure of success. Uh, if you ask what the challenges are, well, you know, they're endless. If last comment, uh, it's not easy. I mean, you, uh, there, uh, there's a cost. There's gains and there's costs, you know, and uh, you just have to make your own decisions. Uh, some of the costs are more severe now than they were in the 60s. So in the 1960s, it was uh, uh, people your age in the 1960s could realistically believe, you know, students at MIT, they could realistically believe that they could take a couple of years off and become involved in, you know, some sort of devote themselves to activism and then come back and go off and end up with a, you know, a nice, rich career somewhere. Uh, that's not true anymore. Uh, there, there's a, a lot of discipline has come about by simply the economic constraints, uh, which are not matters of economic law. They're matters of, so, of decision, you know, decisions within institutions, which have very sharply restricted opportunity and impose discipline. Uh, because there are ways of ensuring that people who step out of line will not be able to step back into line. And there's no point denying that it's true, it's real, and you're going to have people face it. Uh, and that has a disciplinary effect. On the other hand, you know, if you consider the problems that most of the, you know, 99% of the people in the world face, the problems that people like most of us face are, you know, kind of, you, you can't even mention them. I mean, yeah, there we a little repression. I mean, maybe you don't get the job you wanted. You know, maybe somebody yells at you or something like that. But it's nothing like what most of the people in the world have to live with. Uh, so to think that these are obstacles that can't be overcome is just doesn't make any sense. Uh, there are endless possibilities, and the world is what you make of it. Well, having uh, become uh, very active at a time when. Um, I could be a married woman. My husband had a job at a magazine that covered the rent, the car payments, and everything else you could imagine, and not me even having to question. I never knew what he made, or I knew what the rent was. But I really didn't know what the cost of our living was, and I spent all my time, full-fledged, 100%, all day, working in political movements, organizing demonstrations, working on newspapers, sending out press releases. This was my full-time employment from 1967 till, I think, probably about 1979. In 1979, I tried to go get a job. I, did, I had to make up things. I didn't really have any job history. But um, <laughs> this is inconceivable now, that the financial demands of having a home, I don't care how, this, we lived in a studio apartment and then rented bigger things, but to rent a, an apartment or rent a house, to buy a home or buy a house, to own a car, to lease a car, to drive a car, uh, puts a financial burden on a person that does not allow them to spend their full energy and full time in any kind of activism. There's other obstacles that seem to me very, uh, very effective, but quite subtle. And that is the conceptual uh, inability, the inability to conceive of the kind of collective action and enthusiastic collective action that existed under the pressure of mass mobilization and the Vietnam War and the threat of, uh, we thought we were about to get killed as a people. We thought genocide was around the corner and we had a sense of urgency and intensity about our organizing. But the, uh, as an illustration, I was interviewed in Atlanta by a young reporter. She, I think she was about 25, 23, and she was asking me about my career. She, she couldn't get over the fact that there was a former Black Panther at Emory teaching. And, and a lot of people couldn't get over that. And um, so she kept asking me questions and things. And I said, well, I'll let you see this article I wrote. And will tell you something about, um, you know, about my life at that time. And it was an article I had written that was published in Ramparts about um, Eldridge and me and the movement. And at the end, it said, you know, please send contributions to repay the bail. He had left the country. I think his bail was 50000 And people were going to send in contributions to pay this amount. And I said, and, and people did. And we got all the money. And she said, you did? This was inconceivable that you could publish one article in one magazine and get 
thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars because people believed in what you were doing and supported you. I have people telling me it's inconceivable that four or five people can get together because they care enough about a project, rotate who works to pay their bills, the inability that they seem to have, young people seem to have in departing from this individualistic notion of everybody having to have their own things and do their own thing, which is supported by the whole ideologically driven media and education, is that you can't think of yourself as part of a s socially supportive collective group that enjoys being together and doing things together and that this is valuable. I think that's a big obstacle. It can be done. I assure you, it is not hard. It's a lot of fun, but the obstacles, the financial and ideological obstacles that are put in place by the same people who brought you the Vietnam War are what's holding you back, in my opinion. Well, thank you. We only have time for maybe one or two questions from the floor, I think. Uh, but we'll, um, because I think we we'd said something about uh, 9 o'clock or so. Um, so, I, boy, there's a whole line. <laughs> so if you can keep your questions. Yes. Uh, okay. Well, all right. What did you say? Two people at the mic. There's another mic over here if somebody wants to. Okay. And we'll just kind of alternate. Please ask your questions fairly. Make them brief. Uh, and, and at this point, testimonials are not as much fun as asking a question and, and getting the an answer. <laughs> okay. You. Good night. Uh, I am from Guatemala. I am just a visitor here in this university. And both of you, you have a very, an enormous, an, uh, an enormous experience about working in political movements and uh, using or participating or in armed popular struggle or, and, and questioning authority and power. My question is in the landscape, in the perspective, that you have, what kind of political future you see, and what kind of challenge you could mention for the political future between black people and Latino people in this country? I, I think what, I think, but tell me if I'm wrong, that you're asking what is the political future between black people and Latino people in the United States? Is that what you said? The political future? What yeah. Is the what so kind of challenge, what, Colin, what kind of challenge you are seeing according with your experience? What kind of challenge for the possibility to build a common agenda? Ah, okay. Well, um, that's a good question. I heard from some people who had visited uh, the Zapatistas in Mexico that the question that they kept asking, where are the black liberation fighters? Why don't they support us? Where are they? Why don't they come down here? And I remember um, reading when I first read about the, the demands. That we want land, peace, justice, bread, housing, and freedom. I said, but that's the same thing the Black Panther Party said. The, there's a the, sort of an intrinsic identification with the same issues. However, there's a, there seem to be an enormous amount of social barriers, particularly, not, not necessarily in Central America, particularly in the United States, where when you talk about Latino people, too many instances of people who have been mistreated and abused and exploited, but their identification is white. They identify themselves as white, even though a lot of Latinos are obviously black. But their still identification is white, and the conflict and the dynamics in the United States are very antagonistic on a black-white axis. The closer you are to white, the view is the more privileges you have. The further away from white, the less privileges you have. So there's an antagonism that is benefiting the same power structure. And there have been efforts, particularly in California and the Southwest, where you have large black and uh, Spanish-speaking communities to collaborate on certain political tasks, but on certain issues there's always a falling out, particularly if the issue evolves around immigration policy. So in my own view, the um, future depends on enlightened, committed, 
leadership that's not self-serving and not corrupt. And that means they're probably not running for office. But um, I think there's a lot of possibilities, and I think people have to start in organized activities, working together and building a sense of trust. And then when people trust each other, they'll work together and be able to get past some of these barriers. But the barriers were in place before we were born. So it takes an effort, it takes a commitment, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. I was wondering, this is a quick question, and I don't think this mic is on, but uh, anyway. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you're aware of anybody who specifically, any scholars or any group that is specifically tracking the, uh, the reactionary right-wing propaganda in the press. I know Professor Chomsky follows the media very closely. This is something that fascinates me. The Wall Street Journal, for example, has a, has a racist diatribe on the editorial page almost every day. And it's amazing to me that nobody seems to notice this. Could, could you please comment on that? Uh, well, there are groups that are, uh, including in Boston, that are, tar that are concerned with what they call the radical right. But unfortunately, what you're describing is the racist center, you know. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, you know, to target that is to turn mirrors pretty close to home, you know. Uh, and the only people who are really doing it, as far as I know, are, like on the media, are groups who do do media critique, like, say, FAIR, you know, which uh, does a group in New York-based group, which does do this kind of thing fairly regularly. But they're talking about, you know, like the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and so on and so forth. The radical right is, uh, you know, the, the, there are efforts to monitor them. But I agree with you. I think that's not the main problem. It's not the radical right. It's things like the Wall Street Journal, uh, which are not very far away. You know, it's most of the milieu that most of us live in, which is imbued with racism. You know, uh, and uh, uh, it's very deep. You know, I mean, none of us have failed to see plenty of it in our lives. <laughs> um, along this street, there have to be about um, almost 3,000 black people, with the black students within this area. Um, something that hits me close, very close to home is I look into the audience and I see very few um, in the audience. Um, the question that I have is that, you know, how do you provoke people to realize that uh, you know, there's still a lot of issues on the table that regard us, especially in a time when something like Proposition 209 has such a psychological effect on black students that the number of people who haven't applied to, to UCLA has dropped. Uh, how do you do it? Um, I, like, as I said before, there, if there's any techniques, they've been kept a secret for a couple of thousand years. Uh, the, only the only things you can try to do are to educate yourself and others and to organize together with others and to undertake actions to combat these things. Uh, and that can be done in all sorts of ways. Uh, but there is no magic key. You know, it's uh, simply a matter of continual engagement and struggle. And it's got to go on all the time. You know, you can't do it for two weeks and say, okay, it'll be over. Uh, these were indeed some of the illusions of the 60s. Uh, in the 1960s, it was largely a youth movement. Uh, it, because of the effect of the, uh, you know, the real repression of the 50s. And it wasn't, wasn't repression like Guatemala, you know, where you murder a couple hundred thousand people, but it was repression, which got people quiet. Uh, by the time the student movement took off, it was mostly dissociated from rich traditions in American society, which had been broken. Uh, and young people have, you know, did a lot of marvelous things, but often with a very weird perspective. Uh, so, for example, there were, like you take, say, the Columbia strike, which was a big event. I mean, a lot of the students involved in the Columbia strike, I know this from just personal contact, literally believed that if they shut down Columbia for a couple of weeks, uh, that would, then the whole system would collapse. And after that, it would be, you know, freedom and love and peace and all kind of wonderful things. Well, you know, the world is, maybe that's what it looks like when you're 17 years old. I don't, I don't remember, frankly. <laughs> but uh, uh, it doesn't work like that. You know, it is going to be constant struggle on every one of these things. There are going to be attempts to, uh, you know, beat people back, to separate them from one another, to make, uh, I mean, say, take affirmative action. 
I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's an issue on which you can get people to feel, uh, privileged people to feel, look, I'm getting stepped on, okay? Yeah, and it's possible to uh, extend those feelings to make people hate each other instead of looking at the ones who are really oppressing them. And that just has to be overcome. It often is. Uh, like, for example, during, during the CIA organizing drives in the uh, 30s, uh, very intense black-white tension, hatreds were overcome because people were working together on something else. And that's happened over and over again. Well, that's the way to do it. You know? I, I think that there was something you were asking uh, specifically targeted to the black students. Is that... Well, one of the things I think we're seeing that did not exist in such um, uh, obvious fashion when I was a student is uh, the success of this ideology or program that was called integration. I mean, at the time of the um, beginning of the civil rights movement, blacks were very largely excluded either by official, everyday legal segregation or just by casual, customary segregation. So the black community and the community which sustained the activists was separate from the l mainstream. And as a consequence of legal changes, social changes, some level of integration, which has been fairly low, but a lot of propaganda about integration, you have changed the dynamic within the black community so that people who formerly had to work collectively together, had to live in the same place, had to do the same things, had to go to the same schools, now have a lot of choices and are fragmented. And not only are they fragmented, but fragmented in a class structure that didn't exist. For example, the numbers of people who see themselves as middle class are much larger now than when I was um, starting college in 1963. And furthermore, the number of people who have lost a sense of being committed to something we call the community, committed to the community. Black students in college said, we don't want to come here and just join the elite. We want to go and work in the community. And so that spirit seems to have been integrated out of them in a, in a certain sense. And this notion that you could be liberated from something that people have been included in has been uh, a victim of the uh, ideological control. I, that's what I think. So I think people are not able to think in the same way about those issues and th you see a level of passivity that wasn't there because people aren't really correctly analyzing their position. That's my view. Uh, you you um, started to talk about Elmo, Ger Elmo Geronimo Pratt uh, as an example of the Cointel Pro in the state, could you briefly, if that's actually possible, uh, dis discuss what's happened to him since that ass the assassination in '69 up through this year? Well, let me start with this year. In 1997, I think it was on June 10th, after 27 years in prison, after five attempts at habeas petition, all of which were turned down except the last. And after two months of hearings, the evidence that was used to convict Geronimo Pratt in a frame-up, an FBI-induced murder indictment against him, an unsolved murder case, they claimed that he did it. They worked together with the criminal conspiracy section of the, of the Los Angeles Police Department. And on the testimony of an FBI informant within the Black Panther Party named Julio Butler, Pratt was convicted in 1972 of murder, murdering a school teacher, and given a life sentence. And his attorney at that time was Johnny Cochran. He was a young attorney. Um, he's gotten a lot better lately. And in the last case, <laughs> the last time around, on a habeas petition filed in February of 1990. Uh, Six, I believe. I can't keep track. I've been on so many of these cases. When he first initially tried, I was a witness. I was an alibi witness. And I said, no, he didn't do this murder. He was at Black Panther Party Central Committee staff meetings in Oakland for a whole week. Well, my testimony was repudiated because of the FBI guy, and he said that he did it, and he confessed to him, and all these other things. Well, meanwhile, I grew up and went to law school, became a lawyer, worked on a lot of cases, worked on a habeas petition. Finally, we had a judge that had enough integrity to actually examine what had been done. Not a liberal judge, 
but a conservative judge. Not a judge in Los Angeles, but a judge in Orange County. And he looked at the record, he looked at the whole thing, and he said, this is a case that cries out for resolution. And he put this informant on the stand, and he looked at all the evidence, and he came to the conclusion that under the law that existed at that time, this man's conviction had to be invalidated. It should never have even happened, but that's what happened, and that's one example of COINTELPRO in that, yes, it is a victory, it is a victory, but what happened over those 27 years that he was locked down? So how do you replace that, and how do you see that? Who's, whose victory is this? Anyway. Okay, I guess we only have time for one more question, really. What's going to happen? Huh? What's going to happen? What's going to happen if you get out of the building? No, it's just the people are telling me, all, all these people are running around going like this to me. <laughs> huh? I don't know. We'll try another. Well, let's try the question. Hi, Roger Leisner, Radio Free Maine. Next month, Howard Zinn will travel to Berkeley, California to deliver the first annual Mario Savio lecture. Now, for those of you who don't know, Mario Savio was one of the leaders, founders of the free speech movement at the University of California back in the 60s. And I've noted that um, civil rights, the anti-war, free speech also seems to be one of those big issues that you know students gather around on campuses. What do you two see as some of the free speech issues of today. Uh, for instance, I know that some of the black college uh, radio stations in the South have banned rap music from being played. Uh, there's also this whole issue of the V-chip and censorship in the internet and so on. But are there any particular free speech cases that stand out to you? Well, by comparative standards, uh, the United States has a very good record on freedom of speech. Uh, maybe the best in the world. And it's not, it's, it's new. It's not our history. People who tell you it's in the First Amendment don't know American history. It's not in the First Amendment. In fact, the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court actually, you know, passed the minimal test on freedom of speech in 1964 uh, in the context of the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, when it finally uh, uh, invalidated the uh, law against what's called seditious libel, you know, meaning you can harm the state criminally by speech. And as speech, Free Speech Act, you know, lawyers and specialists <laughs> always said, that's the hallmark of a free society when you knock that down. Very few societies have knocked that down. It was done here. It was done as part of the civil rights struggle, which shows you how these things happen. Uh, it, uh, but since that time, and in fact, you know, the, the U.S. has a good record on freedom of speech. There are cases. I mean, there are cases of censorship which are, you know, really bad and so on. But the really serious ones are not what are called censorship, in my opinion. Uh, they are uh, the control over the arena of public discussion and information by private tyrannies. Uh, the country is, after all, run by what amount to totalitarian organizations? They're called corporations. If you look at a corporation, its internal structure mimics, it's a, it's a, it virtually mimics in the social and economic sphere uh, what uh, we call totalitarianism in the political sphere. Uh, and they are, uh, it's true that you, you know, they don't have the coercive power of the state. So you can choose not to be to rent yourself to them and to die from starvation. You're allowed that free choice, uh, and they can't force you to do it. So it's different than state power. Uh, but the uh, extent of their control over the decisions that matter in life is enormous uh, and growing. And part of the general attack on democracy is the attempt to make it grow even further. The things that are very misleadingly called free trade acts, with very little to do with free trade, most of them, uh, you take a look at the way they're designed, their basic design is to try to shift power even more into the hands of unaccountable private tyrannies and out of the public arena. Uh, now, one part of that is control of the media, uh, concentration, of, uh, uh, concentration of control over uh, the ability to find a place to express yourself and to reach and communicate with others. Now, you know, that's not what's called censorship. So the American Civil Liberties Union doesn't make a fuss about that. I mean, take, say, the example that Kathleen mentioned. This book of, it wasn't just mine, mine and Ed, Edward Herman and I, who I, he's an economist at the University of Pennsylvania. We've written a lot of things together, and this book was the first book we wrote together. Uh, well, it wasn't technically censored, 
uh, what happened is that the, corpora it, the corporation that owned the publisher, the corporation is Warner Communications, you know, this big monster. Uh, Warner Communications, an, a Warner Communications executive saw the ads for the book. The book was being published by a subsidiary of theirs. Uh, and they'd, I don't know, they'd printed 20,000 copies or something. He saw the ads for the book. He didn't like it. He took a look at the book. He was totally scandalized. Uh, without going through the details, uh, he ended up closing down the publisher. Okay, uh, that not only eliminated our book, incidentally, it eliminated their entire stock. Okay, uh, in order to prevent this book from being distributed, I felt pretty powerful, I must say. Uh, but uh, the point is that that was not considered a violation of freedom of speech. Like Nat Hentoff wasn't interested, you know, and the First Amendment ab absolutists didn't care, and the ACLU didn't care because this is private power. This is private tyranny exercising its power, which is enormous. Uh, and that's what's happening, say, on the internet. I mean, the internet, after all, what's the internet? You know, it's publicly funded. It's a pub like every, like virtually every part of modern technology. You know, computers, uh, you know, airplanes, you name it. Public pays for it. Uh, and the, part of the reason why people like me get a salary uh, is because MIT is part of the funnel, whereby the public pays the costs of high technology industry. Uh, and then it ultimately gets into the pockets of the guys who own the place. Well, the internet is such an example, a dramatic example. Uh, it uh, was came, comes right out of the uh, the ideas, the uh, technology, the software, the hardware. Everything comes out of the public sector. Uh, he, here, it came out of originally DARPA, you know, defense, the military funding agency, which is largely a method of you know stimulating advanced technology. In Europe, it came out of CERN. It's where the basic ideas of the World Wide Web came from, also a public agency. Okay, after I don't know how many years, like 20, 20, 30 probably years of public funding, uh, design, you know, innovation, and everything else, you get this huge free system around. A year or two ago, it was handed over to private corporations. It was commercialized. And they're happy to tell you what they're going to do with it. You know, you read Bill Gates' new book. He tells you what the problem is with the Internet. Uh, the problem is access is too easy, and there isn't enough advertising. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, they'll <laughs> take care of that, you know. Uh, they'll uh, arrange it, try to arrange it, so that uh, access will be hard unless you want to go through the routines they want you to go through, you know, which means like turning on a television set and listening to 20 minutes of ads before you can see the news or something. Uh, so they'll try to make it like that. And then if you really know what you want, you know, like you're really hyper-driven and you want to find out something about a letter that appeared in Physical Review last month, yeah, you'll be able to do that. Uh, because people like us have to maintain our privilege. We, but uh, for most people, uh, you'll be so, the idea is you'll be so inundated by something modeled on commercial TV, which is just a propaganda institution, that essentially the system will be lost and it'll be used uh, uh, for, uh, you know, again, for making people passive and separating them from one another and turning them into kind of consumerist atoms and making them hate each other and so on and so forth. Now, that's, these things don't, that's, these are the problems of freedom of speech, in my opinion. Uh, those are overwhelming problems, much more than the serious cases of the kind that you mentioned, of literal censorship. They're real, but in our society, they're, they're not enormous. You should fight them because they shouldn't exist, but there's a much bigger monster out there that is not regarded as a, uh, an attack on freedom of speech, and it should be. It's an attack on freedom of speech because it, it takes over the arena of public interchange and information and leaves only small margins on the outside for people to become involved in. That's a very serious attack on freedom of speech. Okay, well, that's it. Um, uh, Kathleen, you're having a seminar tomorrow. Do you want to talk about that? Is that what you were no, mentioning? Specifically, okay. the specifically the Black Panther Party. So if you are interested in that, um, call, you can call, there's a, there should be a number here Huh? Oh, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. Okay, yes. Okay. And uh, other than that, I want to thank you very much for coming to this event and look, look forward to our advertisements for the upcoming events. Thank you.
30s, workers were still getting murdered by private and uh, uh, government security forces. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, fascism was extending over Europe. It was very frightening. <clears throat> I could see it as a child. We were the, we happened to be the only Jewish family in a very anti-Semitic neighborhood, and the immediate sur surroundings were scary. You know, especially with those black clouds in the background. Uh, there just was not ever much of a question. By the time I was 11 or 12, I was hanging around uh, anarchist bookstores in New York and you know, talking to guys who had escaped from Spain during the, you know, after the fascists took over. And, and so it continued. <laughs> <laughs> When did I get started? Uh, my parents were activist radicals before I was born. My father was working on uh, something called the Texas white primary, and it was a democratic primary. The South was uh, all Democrat back then, and there were activists, both black and white, in East Texas trying to put an end to the all white primary. Uh, my mother was um, active in school desegregation in Virginia at the time when uh, blacks could go to black elementary school, black <coughs> high school, and black colleges. But if you wanted to go past, if you wanted to go to graduate school, there was no place in Virginia. So one of her friends was a plaintiff in a lawsuit against the state of Virginia to allow blacks to attend the University of Virginia so they could go to graduate school. And this United, the state of Virginia settled it. And instead of allowing any black uh, person to attend the University of Virginia, what they said is that they would pay their tuition to go to any college, any graduate school in the United States that would take them. So my mother took advantage of this and went to study, she was a mathematician, she went to study at the University of Michigan, which was a much better deal actually, <laughs> than uh, <laughs> University of Virginia. And my parents met there, so she has been an activist, he was an activist, he would come up from Texas and work on his PhD and rural social development, rural sociology, something that was called community development, but that at that time, at that era, very few people knew about it. So I was born into this family, but I was also born uh, around the time that the McCarthy era was becoming very intense. And so even though my parents were active and most of their friends were activists, I, they never talked about it. I never heard about these things. I read about them much, much later. Uh, what I begin to remember is being a, a young child in Tuskegee Institute in Alabama in the 1940s and 50s, where uh, I lived, uh, Tuskegee Institute was 45 miles away from Montgomery, and it was a place where people who started the Montgomery bus boycott in the 1950s civil rights work would come and have meetings, and they planned to do things, and there were boycotts, and I remember going on boycotts, and I remember uh, hearing about voter registration campaigns and lawsuits. I think a million versus Lightfoot is the suit about the gerrymander of Tuskegee. So the world in which I came conscious was uh, an activist world challenging segregation. And then when I was nine years old, my father stopped teaching at Tuskegee Institute. He went to uh, work in a program that at that time was called Technical Cooperation. Tonight, the MIT Committee on Campus Race Relations welcomes you to the first event of a very special series that we're calling Race 2000. This series of events is intended to be both a retrospective about the racial situation in America and a clarion call for the future. Although the dawn of a new century is an arbitrary marking point, we are opting to use this opportunity to consider the ways that race, gender, class, and other, re other related issues were addressed and are currently being addressed as we approach that date. We have entitled the, the event tonight as an evening of conversation because we wanted to create an event that is simple in format yet provocative, profound, inspirational in concept. Conversation. That word is often used in a casual manner and it is rarely used to describe events of great intellectual import. In academia, we have become accustomed to attending debates, colloquia, seminars, lectures, summits, conferences, and symposia. Yet, in my opinion, none of these terms describe that most, most basic form of human interaction, communication, the way that the term conversation does. Tonight, we intend to explore questions that are of profound concern to us all by conversing across lines that are seldom traversed in our modern fragmented society. 
Race is the primary concern of the Committee on Campus Race Relations. However, we realize that it is not possible to comprehensively explore issues of race without also considering gender issues, class issues, sexuality issues, and the entire range of economic and political considerations that influence, the, that influence and affect the qualities of our lives. This event and the other events that will be presented in this series in the, in the coming months is an attempt to create a program that takes into account these complexities. When I first began to tell people about this event, the most frequent question I've been a I was asked is how did we come up with the idea to place Noam Chomsky and Kathleen Cleaver on the same program? People were quick to point out their differences. He is a white male intellectual. She is a black female activist, they said. What could they possibly have in common, I was asked. My answer then and now is that I was thinking about their similarities when we structured the program. They're both educators, both social and political activists, both intellectuals, and they have both dedicated their lives to exploring and implementing ways to bring about positive change both nationally and globally. The program this evening is designed to challenge the traditional limiting and in some instances restricting ways that we have, that we have uh, been divided into, uh, that we've been divided and kept isolated from one another. If we can even be partially successful in finding our common ground and deepening our awareness and commitment to struggling for understanding and change, we will have accomplished our purpose tonight. Before we begin, I'd like to briefly introduce our two guests. Professor Noam Chomsky is a graduate of Harvard University. He has been on the faculty of MIT in the Department of Modern Languages and Linguistics since 1955. He currently holds the position of institute professor. He's received numerous awards, holds several honorary degrees, and belongs to a number of professional and learned societies. Professor Chomsky has written and lectured widely on linguistics, philosophy, intellectual history, contemporary issues, international affairs, and U.S. foreign policy. While it is not possible to recount the extensive list of his published works in this introduction, it is possible for me to state my opinion that Professor Chomsky's works represent in both breadth and depth one of the most remarkable explorations of issues central to any agenda for positive social change in our history. Professor Kathleen Cleaver is currently visiting professor at Benjamin N. Cordozo School of Law. She is a graduate of Yale College and Yale Law School, uh, who, who completed these uh, two degrees in the 1980s. Professor Cleaver's original college education was interrupted in the mid-1960s when she left school to join the Civil Rights Movement. She initially worked full-time in the New York office of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, later moved to Atlanta to continue working with SNCC, and eventually married Eldridge Cleaver and became Communications Secretary of the Black Panther Party. She spent several years in exile in Algiers, Algeria, Algiers, Algiers, Algeria, with her family, all the while continuing to speak on and write on behalf of the black liberation struggle. She returned to the U.S. and completed her education. After law school, she was a member of a law firm, served as a clerk in a U.S. Court of Appeals office, taught at Emory University from 1992 to 1994, and was awarded a Bunting Fellowship in 1995. In addition to, teaching, to, to her teaching duties, she is currently working on her memoir, which she's entitled, Memories of Love and War. Now, after we, just a little bit about the format, after we complete the first part of the program, which will consist of questions and conversation, there will be time for members of the audience to pose questions from the floor. Yeah, where are my questions? Okay, here they are. All right. Okay, so here's the first question. You have both led intriguing lives as radical activist intellectuals. Tell us when you got started on this path. Was there a special incident that provoked your involvement or something in your family background that promoted, that prompted your activism? I got to remember farther back, so I'll go first. <laughs> uh, well, I was a child of the Depression, uh, came from, uh, good part of my family was, uh, it was an immigrant family, first generation immigrants, uh, uh, like other immigrant ethnic communities, very bound to the ethnic group, uh, Jewish in this case. Uh, my immediate family, a lot of them were uh, 
working, most of them, in fact, were working class people that meant mostly unemployed, uh, wide range of, uh, it was a very lively period. Uh, uh, and uh, it was the, uh, very intellectually alive, a lot of activism, and, you know, I sort of grew up in, in the middle of it. Uh, I don't know what to point to. I mean, I have early childhood memories of uh, people coming to the door hungry, trying to sell rags of, uh, uh, traveling on streetcars with my mother and passing by uh, strikes, textile strikes, where women were outside being beaten up by police. We have a very violent labor history in the United States and uh, unusual, in fact, unique in the industrial world. <clears throat> and uh, till Operation Mission later came to be called Agency for International Development, but he went to India in the 1950s at a time when the United States government was beginning to try in third world countries, in non-white areas, in non-European areas, to persuade the government not to be friendly with communists. And one of the ways they decided to persuade the government of India, which was very independent and had just gotten out of a colonial relationship with a European power, with Britain, was to persuade them that the United States was not like their former colonial power. And how did they do this? They found black technicians to send to India to work in villages. My father was one, he took me, and I just looked and saw a beautiful, uh, impressive world in which the entire government and the entire country was run by people of color, and they seemed to be doing quite a good job. And so <laughs> it was no, it, it never occurred to me that there was any validity or any sense or any reason for whites to run everybody's lives. So I immediately became totally uh, un, uh, in, uh, incompatible, uh, improperly socialized to grow up in Alabama. I mean, I'm, where, I, <laughs> where I'm living, you know, the black people run the country, the minister and the president and the prime minister, but in Alabama, where my friends are growing up, their parents, who may have graduate degrees, who have skin color, some, they can't even vote. They can't vote, they can't do anything. So immediately I know this is wrong. Now the incident that kind of triggered my involvement was later. I was a high school student in 1962, I believe, 62, 63. And I saw in the pages of the newspaper outside of Philadelphia in the high school that I was attending. I was a, at a boarding school. My parents were living in Africa, I was there. There was one black professor, uh, one black student from the town, two black boarders, and a Japanese student and an African. The rest of the people were white, everybody. So I'm in this world that's very white. It was the first time in my life I'd lived in Africa and Asia and Macon County, and you don't see too many white people in any of those places. <laughs> um, and these girls were in the back of a paddy wagon, and they were smiling, and they were singing. And the story was about the Albany, Georgia, protest against the denial of the right to vote and the high school students who were getting arrested because they were protesting and they would go to jail and they would sing. And what was so intriguing was that they were smiling and I, I said, well, look, they look so happy. And a young woman put a sign outside the, the dining hall and said, we should fast in sympathy with the students from Albany who are fasting in jail. And I went on in the dining hall, didn't think about it. And the next day I came in and there was another sign up that said, Fasting is stupid. We shouldn't do that. We should find something more cooperative to do to solve this problem. And I became infuriated. Who is this student? They, of course, they're all white because every, and I know it wasn't one of the black students who put this note up. So who is this white boy who's so protected, who has a superior attitude that he can tell young black women in Georgia who are risking their lives to change the system what they should do? So I just became infuriated decided I was going to find out everything about that struggle. I went to Philadelphia. I talked to activists who trained people to go down to Albany. I wrote everything down. I came back in a fury, wrote out the two-page speech, and asked if I could speak at the assembly. Our school had an assembly every, uh, every Tuesday and Thursday. And I asked the art teacher, who was my friend. She said, oh, sure. She didn't ask me what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> she said, sure, Kathleen, you can speak at the assembly. And I got up and I read the speech and told them what this movement was about and what these students were doing and why they were doing it and why Martin Luther King was right and why nonviolence was a good thing and why they should support them. And literally, I had no idea 
to, to sort of upset people. I, it's a Quaker school. I thought they were for nonviolent protests. Uh, that's the um, event that sort of got me going. And then in the same town, Tuskegee, where I was from, one of my classmates, young man I grew up with, when I was a college student here in New York, was murdered, shot in the back by a gas station attendant. It, my friend's name was Sammy Young. He was a student, he was a SNCC worker, he was an activist, and he was murdered after receiving lots and lots and lots of death threats, but he was murdered in an argument with a white gas station attendant over which bathroom he was going to use, the one that used to be identified for white men or the one that used to be identified for colored males because the signs had been taken down. He was shot in the back and left at the Grace Greyhound bus station across the street. And that, that incident was very personal, very painful. And I'd say six months later, I was no longer a college student. I was a civil rights worker. I was a full-time civil rights worker and gradually just became very more and more and more revolutionary as the resistance against our efforts to change the society increased. Okay. <laughs> or a short answer. <laughs> no, it's, it's a good answer. <laughs> what has allowed you both to maintain your momentum for so many years? And I should, you know, all of us know that many people our age have, have fallen by the wayside. The politics change, you get older, you're thinking about all kinds of things, but both of you have continued on in doing the work that you do. What, what, what makes that possible? <laughs> I'd like to know the reason. <laughs> the real reason, the secret, the reason no one will tell you is that it's joyful to struggle. You always feel, at least I feel, happiest when I know I'm doing something that can in some way break through and break down the kind of barriers that restrict people's ability to be creative, to be whole, to be healthy, and it makes me happy. Now, it makes a lot of other people feel different things, and sometimes I've wondered, I mean, as I walk into situations where people are trying to kill me or walk into situations where it looks like, oh, this, this might be it, uh, I don't really feel joy then, but... Um, <laughs> I will say that joining the, I talked to my father into letting me join the civil rights movement with this argument. 